Welcome everyone um, to the BC Children's Kilty Mental Health Resource Center's webinar on supporting children and youth who have experienced trauma. My name is Michelle Horn and I'm the program manager for the Kelty Center. Before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge that the Kelty Center is located on the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. I also wanted to provide a very brief overview of what the Kelty Center offers. Uh, so Dr. Gibson, if you could just go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So we're a provincial mental health and substance use resource center and we help families from across BC understand and navigate the mental health system. We offer peer support through a collaboration with Family Smart and we connect families to resources and tools. Note that we are gonna put our contact information up at the end of the presentation, so no need to jot it down now. Also, before we begin, I just wanted to go through a few housekeeping notes for the webinar. So all attendees are automatically muted and your cameras are turned off, so we can't see or hear you, so you don't need to worry about that. Uh, please submit any questions that you have for the speaker through the Q&A function. Uh, you can see the icon for that at the bottom or the side of your screen. And there's been an option enabled where you can vote for questions uh, that others have posted that you would also like to see answered. If you have any technical questions or comments about um, where you can find the recording or audio or video, please submit those types of questions through the chat function. At the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up that we invite you to complete. Your feedback is really important to us. Uh, also, a note that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available after March 4th on our website and you can find the URL on your screen. Um, we'll also send a link out to the recording tomorrow to the webinar uh, where you will find it. And just also a note that the information in this webinar applies to the context in British Columbia. If you are joining from another jurisdiction, please consult your local health authorities for further information. Uh, we also wanted to acknowledge uh, that a number of you sent in questions on registering for the webinar. We really wanted to thank you for taking the time to submit those questions. Uh, we did receive a range of questions on the topic of trauma and PTSD. We did read through all those questions and have tried to address as many as possible in the presentation. Uh, we noticed that there were some questions from school professionals and educators. So we've taken that away and are discussing with our team what we'll be offering school professionals uh, on this topic in the future. Uh, and as for today's webinar, it has been developed with parents and caregivers as the primary audience in mind. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Julia Gibson is a psychiatrist and completed her training in Vancouver, including her subspecialization in child and adolescent psychiatry through BC Children's Hospital. She is part of the BC Children's Hospital outpatient psychiatry team and also part of the Richmond Early Childhood Mental Health Team. Her areas of interest are trauma, psychotherapy, and advocacy. Outside of work, Dr. Gibson enjoys spending time with her young children and being in nature. So with that, I'll pass it over to you, Dr. Gibson. Thanks so much. All right, hello everyone. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm also coming to you from the unceded uh, traditional lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And I'm very excited to be with you today. Um, trauma is an area of special interest for me. And I, as in my professional work, I do work at Children's Hospital and also I work in a community infant psychiatry team at Richmond. And in both of these positions, I really value the experience of working with patients and their families together. And I really do believe in the power of the parent-child relationship as a powerful source of healing. So it's really exciting to, for me to be presenting to parents for a change today instead of to um, doctors or other um, clinical care providers. Um, I also come to you not just as a psychiatrist, but as a parent of uh, young children as well. So I come with that sort of shared um, parenting experience. And my area of interest in working with youth with trauma really evolved from sort of seeing youth um, that have struggled with trauma-related disorders and how complex and layered and um, distressing the symptoms can be. And then learning that there's treatment that helps and actually working with youth who have trauma-related disorders and seeing them get better and move forward and um, start to grow um, into their, their future has just been really inspiring. And it's, it's work that I just really, really enjoy. So while I'm really excited to be um, presenting today on the topics of what is trauma and what can the impact be, 
and how can you support your child? I'd also like to note that we all come to this moment today with our own lived experiences. And sometimes um, for any one of us, the topic of trauma can be really heavy or challenging. So I invite you to take stock of how you're doing as we go through um, the material. And if you need to take a break or walk away or, or pause the recording, um, I really invite you to do so. Um, as you'll learn as we go through our topic today, self-care is, is so important. And with that in mind, I thought we could perhaps do a little bit of a box breathing exercise. So some of you will be familiar with box breathing, some of you won't, but essentially it's a, a tool that you can use um, when you're feeling distressed or anxious to on a physiological level, just kind of ground yourself and uh, feel more calm. So the idea is we'll inhale for four seconds together, hold it for a second, exhale for four seconds, and then hold the exhale again for four seconds too. So um, I can't see you, and uh, but you can see me, and I'm gonna do this exercise alongside you because as a psychiatrist, I'm feeling anxious, not being able to see your faces and read your facial expressions. Um, so we can all kind of adopt a comfortable position. You can choose to close your eyes or not. And we're just gonna breathe in, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four, breathe out, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four. So we'll just do two more rounds. Inhale, hold, exhale, Hold, inhale, hold, exhale, and hold. And in your own time, just opening your eyes up again if you had decided to close them and maybe noticing if you feel different um, internally compared to before we did the exercise. So that's an easy tool that's available to you anytime during this presentation or at any time during your life and traffic jams, whatever. And it's also a helpful strategy for our youth as well. Um, sometimes we modify it for younger children and we have them um, sort of envision their favorite slice of pizza and then they're smelling it, taking deep breath in and then they're blowing on it to cool it off. Okay. So let's jump in here. So in terms of what is trauma or a potentially traumatic event, really it's quite far ranging what could be considered a traumatic event, but at the core, it's a situation that feels intensely threatening to a child. And that can be a single incident, like an accident, a fire, something like that, or it can be more of a pattern of like in abusive interactions or neglect. Um, so there's quite, um, a variety of different experiences, but the important thing is that the child or the youth felt intensely threatened by the experience. That's what makes it a traumatic event. And a traumatic event for one person may not be experienced as traumatic for another person for a variety of reasons. So we're gonna start with the bad news, which is that uh, potentially traumatic events are actually quite common. Even if we look at a fairly narrow slice of what we would consider a traumatic event, to, and we're just looking at physical or sexual abuse or witnessing violence, uh, research done by Statistics Canada shows us that about a third of Canadians will experience one of these um, potentially traumatic events um, before they turn 18. So it's certainly not uncommon. And there's a spectrum within each one of these different types of uh, traumatic events. And then when we look at larger scale studies that have been done in other countries, we and we consider all types of potentially traumatic events, including like a sudden traumatic grief or a forced separation or a car accidents, fires, um, emotional abuse, the whole spectrum of potentially traumatic events, we see that a majority of youth will actually experience some type of potentially traumatic event um, during their childhood or adolescence. And there are some subgroups with higher pre prevalence of experiencing traumatic events. This list is not exhaustive, um, but there has been more research on these, these subgroups, such as intellectually or developmentally disabled youth, street-involved youth, youth in care, and communities experiencing systemic racism. 
And I think right now in our current era of uncovering the unmarked graves of indigenous youth in residential schools, we're really having a moment of reckoning as a society about the systemic injustices that have been visited on um, the indigenous um, peoples of our land. So here's some good news, which is that uh, children and youth are resilient. We know that most of children and youth that experience a traumatic event will not develop persistent trauma symptoms. And of those that do, the research suggests that at least for single event traumas, like a car accident or a fire, about half of them will spontaneously resolve within a matter of several months. Um, that, that would be less likely for youth who've experienced repeated traumatic experiences, this spontaneous resolution. And I also invite you to consider that while six months doesn't feel like a long time, if we consider the developmental stage of children and youth, six months is actually a really long time to be struggling with trauma-related symptoms. So I would advocate for directing them to care um, instead of hoping that it would resolve within several months. But it is nice to know that for half of youth that have a single traumatic event, it's likely to resolve on its own. We often will see that in the same family, siblings can be exposed to the exact same trauma and one can seem to be doing absolutely fine and the other is quite distressed or impaired. Or sometimes they're equally distressed or impaired, but in totally different ways. And there are so many factors that, again, this list of different factors that come into play um, is not exhaustive. But the one that I would like to focus on is the support piece, because that's really what we're here to talk about today. So it's very clear that one of the strongest protective factors against developing a trauma-related disorder and to also help with the treatment of trauma-related disorder is social support. And that's for everyone, adults, children, everyone who's, who might experience a traumatic event. But for children and youth, of course, this is especially important because they're really embedded within the family system. And parental support is, um, so in, in treatment, is considered a real catalyst for the healing and pretty integral to the treatment model of trauma-focused CBT at least but also the support of teachers and friends is very powerful. So this slide is really important. We know that parental support will lead to a better outcome for youth, but equally as important, parental well-being leads to a better outcome for youth. And in my work, I spend a lot of time on this uh, with families because trauma usually impacts the whole family in some way, even if the parent isn't directly involved. And it's really hard for parents to prioritize their self-care. So we'll start with the parental support piece. So this is my favorite Venn diagram of all time. If I ever get a tattoo, it's gonna be this Venn diagram. Um, it's this concept that the orange circle represents everything you could possibly worry about. And the yellow circle represents everything you have any ability to influence or control. And the idea is that it only makes sense to focus your efforts, your time, your energy on that area of intersection. It doesn't make a ton of sense to worry about a bunch of stuff you have no ability to control. And it doesn't make a bunch of sense to, to put a lot of effort into trying to control things that don't matter to you. And oops, when we think about parenthood, when our kids are babies, usually we have a lot of ability to control what they wear, what they eat, who they see, where they go. And then as they grow and evolve into little mini adult adolescents, our area of influence is drastically diminished to this smaller area of overlap here that essentially boils down to stuff you pay for and the quality of your relationship. So the way you show up in your relationship with your teenager is something that you have some control over too. And that's something that I really recommend investing a lot of energy into. So the parent-child relationship is really, really important. And just um, a note, I'll be using the term parent and caregiver interchangeably here. Um, so of course, some caregivers are not biological parents, but I will use the term parent and caregiver interchangeably. And this um, parent-child relationship is very important because it really forms the way that the child grows to think about themselves. Am I lovable? Am I valued? Uh, what should I expect in relationships? And being open and in your communication about feelings with your child will really help improve the amount of information that you get um, back from them. And everything that you're already doing as children, uh, as a parent to your child right now, like 
noticing their feelings and trying to respond to their emotional needs as well as their practical needs, caring about them, obviously, otherwise you wouldn't take this hour of your time to be at this seminar. All of that will really go into making this quality parent-child um, relationship. And um, the last point on this slide is about the power of being with. So when we validate our child's emotional experience, it helps them move through that emotion. So, um, and this isn't just for trauma-related disorders. I talk about this with parents for any kind of mental health presentation because it applies to kids who are angry, kids who are sad, kids who are anxious, um, kids who are scared. And um, the idea is that as parents, often our knee-jerk reaction when our child has a problem is to either reassure them the problem's not a problem or to jump into problem-solving mode and try to get them to the other side. And really, those have their place, but they're not helpful at all in terms of helping to emotionally regulate the child. And validation is really what helps to bring the intensity of that emotion down. And I will share some resources at the end for how to beef up your skills in, in validation. And it's kind of counterintuitive. If your child fell in a mud puddle, you probably wouldn't sit in the mud puddle with them and talk about how muddy and squishy it is. But with emotions, that's actually what helps them move through it faster. So when we're thinking about how to support our child with trauma, it kind of helps to think about, well, what does trauma look like? And many of us, when we hear the word trauma, we think PTSD. But PTSD is a very specific diagnosis with, with very specific diagnostic criteria. And there's only a, a thin sliver of the whole spectrum of traumatic experiences that count to get the diagnosis of PTSD. And what I think would be more important than focusing on the labels or how you know what disorder they have, where, where you're all parents or caregivers today, what I'd like to focus more on is not uh, the labels, but the impact. Because research shows that you can have similar levels of distress and negative impact on a kid's functioning and on their life, whether they meet the PTSD label or not. So it doesn't actually, it's not actually that important for what we're here to talk about today. What I'd more like to talk about is the impact of trauma, which falls along these five domains. Um, so emotional, behavioral, uh, cognitive, relationship, and biologic. And um, this is um, based on Cohen and Manorino's work. And um, we'll have a link to some of their resources as well on the Kelsey Mental Health website. Um, so the first domain here is the emotional impact. So um, you may or may not have seen the Disney movie Inside Out. Um, but I think this helps to illustrate the point that um, trauma can impact different kids in different ways. Some will present as very angry, some will present as anxious, some will present as sad, others present as sort of emotionally numbed out or they'll describe being emotionally numb, not really being able to access their emotions, and others are kind of all over the map, quite volatile. Often, when there is a trauma-related disorder, there is another comorbid uh, mental health difficulty alongside, like a depression or anxiety. But sometimes, trauma-related disorders are actually misdiagnosed as oppositional defiant disorder, depression, anxiety. And um, what I've noticed is that sometimes when the typical treatments aren't working and the, the child's very treatment resistant, uh, eventually it is uncovered that possibly there was a traumatic event that's actually at the root of this. And that explains why the usual treatments aren't working is because we're not actually targeting the root, which could be trauma. The next domain is the behavioral impact. So this can be quite broad. Again, this list is not exhaustive. Um, but some of the behavioral outcomes of a trauma, a, a trauma-related disorder could be that the youth um, evolve some problematic coping strategies like substance use or self-injury. Other youth, because the fight or flight system is really revved up, they might present as really reckless or aggressive or avoidant because um, they don't want to be experiencing their, their trauma cues or reminders in the community. And then another type of impact it can have is that it causes a child to be or a youth to become over-functioning. And those are kids that don't usually get brought to our clinical attention because they're perfectionistic, they're trying to care for everybody else, and nobody really flags that as a problem. They're kind of like mini parents. Um, but that actually is problematic if we think about the fact that it sort of robs them from the ability to just be a child for that period of their, of their life. Another domain that trauma can impact is the cognitive domain. So sometimes they'll be flagged for uh, clinical assessment because suddenly they begin to struggle in school. Uh, it's harder to learn, it's harder to perform academically. 
but also some untrue and unhelpful thoughts can emerge as a result of trauma. And often that's because um, this awful thing happens and there's no good reason for why something so terrible has happened. And so the child may struggle, struggle to, may develop some inaccurate or irrational thoughts or beliefs to help make sense of what happened. So common, um, unhelpful and toxic thoughts would be thoughts like it's my fault or I deserved it or thoughts about others like nobody can be trusted or thoughts about the world like the world's not safe. Um, when the perpetrator has been a parent, it can be more painful for a child to actually place the blame on the parent than on themselves. And um, any one of these kind of uh, toxic, negative, unhelpful, unhealthy thoughts that evolve from trauma can go on to shape the rest of their lives. You can imagine if a child believes something's their fault or they're to blame or no one can be trusted, the world's not safe, that will impact the relationships they make, the decisions they make and, and who they become. So this is something that in the treatment of, of trauma, at least in trauma-focused CBT treatment, you're really working to, to uncover what kinds of cognitive distortions or toxic thoughts might have evolved from the trauma and kind of uproot them so that they don't, they don't shape um, the youth's future. <clears throat> Lastly, the biological impact. So there's a lot of research on this. It's very nerdy and detailed. So I'll just sort of hit the points that I think might be interesting to you as parents, which is that um, a lot, often youth who've been through traumatic experiences will have physical symptoms, headache, stomach ache, that kind of thing. Um, and some will often have panic attacks um, with trauma reminders or flashbacks or even nightmares that can trigger panic attacks. Um, it does have an impact on brain development and growth. Um, and there's been some parts of the brain where the changes in the development or growth um, sort of um, become more or less significant based on the duration of the trauma. So we can really uh, establish that it is because of the trauma. There's also shifts in hormones and neurotransmitters. And one thing I find myself talking to school professionals about or helping advocate with families, with um, their child's teachers about, is that can affect brain functioning as well in terms of their sensitivity to threat. So there's been fMRI imaging studies where they show neutral pictures and threatening pictures to children who've experienced trauma, children who haven't experienced trauma. And what we can reliably demonstrate is that children who have experienced trauma have a way lower threshold to perceive threat. So if you imagine that this woman here is a child's teacher and a child's working and then they look up and they see the teacher looking at them like that, you or I might think that's a neutral expression, but the child might actually perceive that as quite threatening. That might cause a uh, behavioral or emotional dysregulation or an outburst that might get them into trouble, that might reinforce the negative view of themselves, and the whole um, cycle keeps going. So that's a really important piece to highlight to, to teachers. And oftentimes it can be helpful if the family is willing to share that there is a trauma history and that this is impacting the way that they're functioning in the classroom environment. It doesn't mean you have to give all the details. And of course, you wouldn't share anything the child's not comfortable with sharing. Uh, but sometimes schools um, can be much better equipped to support children with that kind of information. So those are the five different domains uh, that trauma can impact. And I just briefly touched on each of them. Um, but I hope I've convinced you that the symptoms are quite diverse and they can be quite distressing and impairing. And there's no one picture for what a trauma-related disorder looks like. So it's really more of a pattern, like a traumatic event happens, and then you notice some of these shifts in your child. Sometimes you're not privy to the information that the traumatic event happened. Of course, if you also experience the traumatic event, you know. If your child happens to feel comfortable telling you about the traumatic event, you know. But if your child doesn't feel comfortable telling you about the traumatic event, and that that's quite frequent, then it can be a bit of a puzzle to you sometimes when you notice some of these, these shifts. And even in families where the parent-child relationship is really solid, it's quite common that children or youth will not disclose a traumatic event, especially for certain types of trauma, like for example, sexual abuse. Um, and the reason can often be that they, they don't wanna burden caregivers. So a lot of kids will not tell their parent that they had a traumatic event or that they're experiencing these symptoms because they really don't wanna stress the parent out. Um, also, there can be some shame or self-blame and sometimes explicit threats from the perpetrator that, um, that make the child feel uh, like they, they're reluctant to disclose to their caregiver, even if there is a close and open relationship. 
So what to do? Um, well, the first thing, of course, that's important is safety. So the first thing you want to do is ensure there's no ongoing risk, obviously. So if there was a perpetrator, ensuring that there'd be no more contact or other risk management strategies that are dependent on the traumatic experience. And then the second piece is to reassure a child of their safety. So you never want to lie to a child. Um, so if it's a situation where you can 100% guarantee that some feared event would never happen, then you want to reassure them that you're do you've done everything that you can to keep them safe. And that if that event were to happen, there's a plan and here's what the plan is. So in terms of a plan, um, for example, for let's say um, sexual abuse, there's um, a plan that's been developed that's quite popular for younger children where you give them a strategy. And this, is, this should be taught in elementary school. This should be just something that all kids know, which is that if their personal boundaries have been violated, they say no firmly, directly, they go, they get the heck out of there. And then they tell an adult that they trust. And if the first adult doesn't believe them or doesn't respond in a way that feels like it makes them more safe, they would tell another trusted adult until they find somebody who believes them. Um, I really like this book. It's always not far from my desk, super duper safety school. Um, so this is really great. Um, oftentimes, so I do trauma focused CBT and oftentimes we'll, we'll implement this book um, at the end of the therapy because the last module of the therapy is um, enhancing future safety and development. But I really feel like I wish this was kind of part of school curriculum and everybody just had it because it's very, it's in very empowering language. So it's not like fear mongering and it just kind of um, teaches kids age four and up. It's sort of the target audience about body safety and what they call tricky people. So when we grew up, it was stranger danger, but we know now that most abusers are actually known or perpetrators are known to the child. So it's no longer about stranger danger. It's about tricky people and how to kind of have their, their flags raised if an adult um, does something tricky, like ask them to keep a secret or ask an adult asking a child for help, like with directions or something. Um, it's really great. Um, so if your child has had a traumatic event and they are having some trauma-related symptoms, it's really important for their sense of stability to keep a routine, some form of routine, to make sure they're still getting adequate sleep, exercise, nutrition, and to just have a really calm and consistent approach. And sometimes this is actually really hard um, because oftentimes the trauma impacts the whole family. So as a parent, you yourself may be having some really big feelings and the child may be having some behaviors that make it really, really tricky to stay calm around them sometimes if they're more angry or aggressive. Um, so it's really important as we'll touch on to do self-care so, so that you can, so it's reasonable to expect that you could even be, have that calm and consistent approach and to maintain connection to friends and family. So we talked earlier about how social support is the biggest protective factor against developing trauma-related symptoms. And it's also an important part of the healing. So you wanna make sure they don't begin to isolate. Um, Sometimes uh, youth who've been through a traumatic event will um, sort of pull back from their usual um, supports. Um, one domain that um, I had hoped to touch on was the relationship domain. And I'm noticing now that that slide didn't make it into here. So I'll just briefly talk about the relational domain too. Um, sometimes when a trauma impacts the youth, it makes them isolate or pull away from their friends right at the moment when they most need it. So right when they most would benefit from social connection, they struggle with feelings like they're different from their friends. Their friends wouldn't accept them if they knew that this traumatic thing happened to them. And they might begin to associate with um, peers that are also um, troubled. And then um, they can actually establish relationship patterns that can increase the risk of developing further, um, of experiencing further traumatic events. So sorry that slide wasn't in there, I'll edit it before we send out the handouts. Um, and then the last point on here is the stability. So really important um, to have the school support as I referenced earlier, um, to make sure that in the school environment, school professionals know enough to try to keep that environment uh, feeling as safe and supportive as possible. Um, another really important piece is the communication. So I noticed that some of the questions that came in ahead of time were about how to open up a dialogue or how to speak with a youth um, about these kind of things. So again, as I mentioned earlier, the better the parent-child relationship, the more likelihood that there's gonna be open sharing of information, but even still sometimes that information isn't shared. So if you're gonna wanna invite sharing, 
it's really important to find that balance of inviting sharing without pressuring your youth to share more than they feel comfortable. Because there is some evidence that forced debriefing or like forced sharing about traumatic details can actually increase or worsen the symptoms, the trauma related symptoms and likelihood that they will go on to develop symptoms and distress. So it's about finding that balance um, between wanting to learn about it so that you can support them, but not putting too much pressure or forcing them to share more than they're feeling comfortable with. Of course, at the same time, you're also trying to balance getting enough information to know that you're ensuring their current safety, that there's no ongoing risk. So one nice way to open that conversation might be after you attend this, um, this workshop um, to say something like, I learned that more than half of kids have a scary experience at some point. I just want you to know that I'm here and would always want to know and help. So just opening that door, remembering that kids will often hide their distress to avoid upsetting parents. So they might really want to tell you, but they're feeling ambivalent because they're worried that they're going to stress you out. And then you open up this line and then that might be what kind of opens the door for them. And you want to pick a good time where you're feeling calm. Maybe you do some box breathing before you approach them. And it's a time where you have enough time and a confidential space to really have that conversation if they happen to be ready to do it right then. Um, you, of course, want to be open and validating of their emotions, not critical or peppering them with too many questions. Um, and you want to keep messages truthful, healthy, and age appropriate. So whatever kind of trauma kids experience, it really rattles their sense of safety and trust, either trust in other people or trust in the fairness of how the world works. Um, and so it's super important that for them to feel safe in their relationship with you, that they know that you're always going to be truthful with them. So you still have to keep their age into consideration and make thoughtful choices about how much detail you share or the words that you choose to use, but you never want to give misinformation. Um, you always want to be truthful and be delivering truthful and healthy um, messages. And you don't need to know that all the answers. So it's good to have a couple of stock phrases in the back of your mind, like, Thank you for sharing this with me. I'm so glad we can talk about this together. You know, so they might share something with you and you're like, I don't know how to respond to that. Just thank them. Thank them for having the courage to share that with you. Let them know that you're grateful. And even if you're becoming tearful or upset, that's okay. You're, you're human and that, that, that will happen. Um, so it's then, but then it's doubly important to say thank you and that you're, you're grateful to know this information. And you can say, I know I'm crying right now because I'm so sorry this happened to you, but I'm so grateful. I'm so glad that you felt able to talk to me. And if they ask a specific question that you're like, oh gosh, I have to think about this. I don't know how to answer this. I don't know what the age appropriate healthy messages. I want some time to talk with my therapist or talk with my family doctor or talk with a friend or think it through. You can say, this is a really important question. So I'm going to give it some thought and we'll talk about this tomorrow or in a couple hours or whatever feels reasonable. In communicating openly about emotions, like even when you're watching shows or reading books, like how do you think that character feels? How do you think they feel? And then identifying your own emotions sometimes, like you're in a traffic jam or something like, oh, I'm getting so frustrated waiting because we're late. I'm going to do some box breathing. And you're modeling, right? Emotion identification regulation and helping them identify their feelings too, right? Can be super helpful in validating their feelings so that the intensity of their feeling decreases. And, and teaching them some coping skills. There are a lot of resources like books and, and websites, and I'll reference them at the end of this talk, but then also the Healthy Mental Health site will have a, a list too. Odin Bookstore has a lot of mental health um, related books and a lot of trauma specific books for different types of trauma um, as well. Um, and um, one sort of more generic one, the one I have pictured there is a terrible thing happened. So this is kind of a catch all uh, regarding a generic um, terrible thing and how it impacts this little raccoon that can be helpful um, to help kids make sense of what's going on for them. But the most important messages that I would love for you to be able to impart to your child that's had a traumatic experience that's impacting them is that it's not their fault and they're not alone. Because those are the common toxic thoughts that, that they'll feel is like there's something bad or different about them. It's their fault. They're alone with this. Nobody else has had a similar feeling. Um, and so it's really, really important to emphasize it's not their fault and they're not alone. So they're not alone because you're there to support them, but also they're not alone because other kids have gone through similar experiences. And that's where it might sometimes be helpful to share some information about what you've learned about 
the prevalence of, of, tra of traumatic experiences. And then it's important to connect to care. So obviously if a good first referral source or person to go to would be your family doctor if you're having concerns that your child does have some trauma related symptoms. And they could maybe um, perform like a symptom scale or help just to kind of assess the child and speak with you and figure out if a referral to psychiatry would be appropriate or um, going to one of your local mental health teams. So those all um, mental health teams in BC, there's like 90 something of them, 96 maybe, they are there to serve um, children in communities aged six to 19 years old. And it's self-referral process. You Google it it's on the government of BC website and you call the number, you ask for a referral, you do like a 60 to 90 minute intake and then they triage you. So sometimes it can be a bit of a wait, but it's really good to get that ball rolling earlier if you think that's something that you'll end up um, needing um, to benefit from. There are foundry clinics too. So they serve a slightly older age range, 12 to 14. Um, the P, there's a PEACE program. So that's non-directive play-based therapy for younger kids or other kinds of educational or therapeutic interventions for the older kids who've witnessed violence. So that's fairly specific. If there was a crime element to it, like um, in the sexual abuse or something like that, then the Crime Victims Assistance Program can, can pay for um, like trauma-focused CBT or other trauma therapies. Um, if you're struggling to access um, a therapy, some, or if you're struggling as a parent to, to support your child because of your own mental health concerns and, and it's impacting the child's um, mental wellness, you can call MCFD or um, Backfast for a sub support file. Um, they do subcontract out with different um, providers to, to fund for, for therapy for families where that's needed and there's not there's limited finances. Um, that's done on a case by case basis. And then also if you have protection concerns, active protection concerns for your child or a child, you can also report them um, to those same authorities as a protection concern. And then privately, if you have benefits through work or you have adequate uh, financial means, you can Google <laughs> a therapist. Um, I like the Psychologist BC website because you can filter it by age category and trauma and you want CBT or some other therapeutic modality. Um, and it'll give you like a shorter list in your area if you want like a gender preference for your provider, but you can filter that too. And then um, tfcbt.org, that keeps a, a registry of everybody who's certified in trauma-focused CBT, but a lot of the clinicians at the mental health team have done um, some trauma-focused CBT training, but they might just not be certified, and same with um, private therapists as well. And the Kelsey Mental Health website, as Michelle referenced earlier, is just a, a great starting point to help navigate the system if you're struggling here. But sometimes that's actually the relatively easy part, and what can be harder to do is to convince your child or youth to engage in therapy. Um, again, this list is not comprehensive, but this is a few of the therapy modalities that have some evidence based in helping kids with trauma-related disorder. So trauma-focused CBT happens to be the most evidence-based um, uh, treatment for youth with trauma. Medications really have a limited role. The evidence base is not great for medications for treating trauma-related disorders in children and youth, with the exception of treating nightmares or sleep. Um, problems that medications can help with, but otherwise that, or if they have comorbid mental health concerns that could benefit from medications, that would be another thing. But for the trauma itself, it's really um, talk focused therapies that have the most evidence and the biggest effect size that lasts the longest, uh, according to available research right now. And there is also um, some evidence to support EMDR. The evidence base is not as strong and the impact doesn't seem to be as robust or last as long. Um, but for some youth, that's a more palatable option. Um, and play therapy can be really helpful for the younger kids as well as child-parent therapy, where that parent-child relationship is the vehicle for healing from a traumatic event. Um, so trauma-focused CBT takes like 12 to 20 sessions and child-parent therapy takes about up to 50, like 30 to 50 sessions. So they're very different models. Um, and there's other many, many other models too, but those are the ones that are sort of the most known and, and evidence-based. Um, and when a youth is reluctant to engage in therapy, a line that I will often use and um, that you could try with your youth if they're resistant is something to the effect of like, because one really important thing to know is you can't really therapize someone against their will. It doesn't work. So it's more, and with teenagers, you may have experienced that the more you try to push them to do something, the more they kind of like equally and opposite oppose. Um, and so 
um, sometimes it's better to really focus instead more on the quality of your relationship and really making those invitations and um, encouragements without applying too much pressure. So it could be something like, you know, it's so awful and it's so unfair that this thing happened to you. And the only thing that could be more awful or more unfair is if that thing that happened in your past gets to shape the rest of your future. And that's something that we have some control over. We can't control the past. We can control what we do right now. That can sometimes um, open the door. Okay, moving on to the second piece of having a better outcome for your child. So parenting support is one piece and then parental well-being is another. Um, so there's this metaphor, right? That, well, there's the oxygen mask one. You put your oxygen mask on for the child. And then there's also this concept of you can't pour from an empty vessel. So I'd like you to just take a minute to think about what this brings up for you in your own experience with your child. And what does self-care mean to you? How have you been caring for yourself? Um, so we know from research that kids do better when their parents are doing better. So when parents are, are doing better, are more healthy, prioritize their own self-care so they're in a better um, place, that has a really protective factor against um, their, their children struggling with mental health um, difficulties. Or if the child's already struggling with mental health difficulties, um, the research shows that it yields faster recovery. And also on a super practical level, it sets a healthy example of prioritizing self-care of using tools to regulate your emotions, of prioritizing yourself remaining socially connected and being open to vulnerability and seeking support when you need it. Whether it's asking a friend to babysit for you because you need to just get out of the house or whether it's going for your own mental health assessment or support. And I spend a lot of time in my work with um, helping children who've been impacted by trauma in, in just um, convincing the parent that it's okay to prioritize your own wellness because you're actually also helping the child by doing that. And the research is very, very consistent with that. Um, I do wanna take a little moment. This could be a whole talk of itself, the concept of intergenerational trauma. And I really like this quote, um, pain travels through family lines until someone is ready to heal it in themselves. By going through the agony of healing, you no longer pass the poison chalice onto the generations that follow. It's incredibly important and sacred work. I'll just add a note that if it's good trauma therapy, it shouldn't actually be agony. <laughs> it should feel comfortable and safe. Otherwise, um, it's not the right provider for you, but it is hard work, just the same. So as I was composing this slide last night, I felt very hypocritical because <laughs> I'm trying to emphasize that caregivers need to do self-care and I'm realizing that I myself, I'm not pretending it's easy to prioritize self-care, but this is a list of activities that we give to youth who've experienced trauma for self-care, things to make them feel better in the moment. And I invite you to, and to pick a thing or two on there, add something on there that you might try to do for yourself uh, tonight or within the next coming week. So um, the last real slide here, the key points that I hope I conveyed today is that traumatic events are common, but kids are resilient. And trauma really hurts, it can have a deep impact but kids can heal. That's my favorite part of working with kids that have had trauma is they, they can heal. And it's just super inspiring to watch. And lastly, and uh, also very important is that parents are a really powerful source of healing. Um, so here's just a few of the, the resources that I'd like to highlight this top one here. That has four modules, the total runtime is less than three hours, and it'll give you like a black belt in validation that'll help decrease the intensity of your child's emotion, no matter what the flavor of emotion is. Um, some of these other books I talked about, this is a great website with brief specific questions. This is a good go-to for, for trauma-related resources for school professionals or parents. And then of course, the Kelsey Mental Health website. And I just, before I pass the virtual microphone back to Michelle, I'd just like to thank you all for your attention today and also for showing up for your children by coming to learn more. Um, about this topic that um, I'm really passionate about and I'm really happy to answer some questions now. Thank you so much, Dr. Gibson, for this really comprehensive um, presentation. It's been very informative um, with lots of information that you're able to cover. So, uh, so we can get to as many questions as possible. We can jump right into the Q&A now.
Um, so I'll try to answer as many as I can that came through through the Q&A. There was also a few that were submitted beforehand that we were able to incorporate into the content. So I'll also ask those questions, Dr. Gibson, as well, too, that we had uh, flagged beforehand. Um, Great. Off, I'm going to start with one of those questions that came through when uh, someone registered for the webinar. And a parent was asking, how do you best support your child when you are also experiencing trauma? Yeah, this is so, so key. And I don't know that I've ever actually worked with a family where the parent wasn't in some way also impacted by the trauma. Because even if you don't, haven't directly experienced it, just seeing your child be impacted by trauma is traumatizing on some level, right? And the Herculean task of helping to help heal your child from trauma, it's really not a reasonable ask of a parent who's, who's struggling with their own trauma without any support. So that's, again, where I really encourage parents to prioritize their own, um, their own care and access their own their own trauma support. Um, and the, the web, the network of accessing mental health support is always a little bit confusing, even for those of us in the business. Um, but I think a good place to start would be to start with your, your family physician. And some of those websites that I referenced, like the BC Psychology website, that's not just child specific, that's for adults too. And, and, and making sure that um, if you do attempt therapy and it doesn't work out, that can happen. It's the same thing as trying a medication. The first one doesn't really work out. Sometimes it's just a fit issue and it doesn't mean anything negative about the therapist or you. It's just that the fit wasn't great. So one thing that I really encourage parents to is if you've tried counseling, it hasn't gone well to, to try, even though it's really hard to open up again to someone new to just try an, another therapist because it could be the fit and the fit is so important. Great, thank you so much. So the next question also was submitted before the webinar, and we've heard this from many parents who have also contacted the Kelty Center um, around that talking to your child who has experienced um, a traumatic event. And how do you find the balance of approaching the trauma but not having the child relive the experience and traumatizing them even more? Yeah, it is such a such a, and I think I I touched on this, and it is a tricky balance, and it's really hard to like give a prescription that's going to fit all kids in all scenarios. But also parents know their child better than anyone. And so I think a really nice approach is to have like to set your expectations for the first time you broach the topic with the child as my goal is opening the door. My goal is demonstrating to my child that I want to hear this, that I'm here for them that I, I know that this could be a thing. Um, maybe they are aware for sure, or maybe they're just suspecting it. And so um, some of those conversations starting um, sentences that I shared can be, can be a nice idea. Um, and, you know, I would also, again, just reference those validation websites because the modules, because they teach you about how to validate, even if your kid's not giving you much. And that can feel hugely um, hugely regu regulating for a child, just to know that you even want to, that you're there, that you're trying, even if you don't know all the answers is so healing in and of itself. And just, just following the child's lead, they'll let you know if it's too much, they'll let you know if they're not feeling comfortable. And it's, um, and the, the energy that you bring to the conversation in terms of framing it as an in invitation, as opposed to inquisition, um, will also help prevent it from being experienced as, as as traumatizing. And in, in our therapy work, in trauma-focused CBT, before you get into processing the narrative, you're working on like emotion coping skills, self, like emotion identification, emotion regulation, grounding, like the box breathing. So even just beginning to help introduce your child to some of those strategies or modeling that you do it too, that can be a nice place to start too. So they have some resources if it does become upsetting for them at the moment. Great, thank you. And one last one that was submitted beforehand, and then we'll jump over to the Q&A in the webinar. So a parent was wondering specifically about recurrent nightmares and PTSD and what specifically to do about nightmares that are recurring. Yeah, so the nice thing about nightmares is that that's one of the things that our medications can actually help with, which in, in trauma, the medications really have a pretty limited role. Um, so in those situations, I would encourage, um, you don't have to do medications, but some um, if if they get involved in, in trauma-focused CBT or some other trauma therapy, as the trauma resolves, as um, they process their trauma and they heal, the nightmares should decrease in frequency. But 
Sometimes it's also helpful to consider medication options and just discussing the medication option called prazosin um, with, your, with your family physician. Um, I believe on the Kelsey Mental Health website under medications, the prazosin handout is currently in a draft format and maybe not up yet, but maybe I'll just inquire with Dr. Elb if, if that could be made available too, because um, that would, I've seen really, really great, um, great resolution of, of nightmares with that. There's also some specific therapy modalities to target um, nightmares, it's uh, image rehearsal therapy, um, but I would probably opt instead for like trauma-focused therapy and, and prazosin. Yeah if the chuck can tolerate it. Great, thank you. So I'm just gonna jump over to the Q&A now and there was a few questions regarding um, medications and treatment. So maybe um, because we're talking about that, we can um, address those ones. So a parent was wondering if a child is misdiagnosed with depression or anxiety and they're prescribed medication, will those medications be effective? So just if you wanted to add to, add to that at all. So if there's no depression and it's just trauma, the antidepressant medication won't be helpful because the evidence base for those medications helping trauma are very poor. Um, but it again, it is really common to have both trauma and depression. And as a clinician, it's really tricky sometimes to disentangle um, depression from one category of PTSD symptom can be a negative alteration in mood with a persistent negative emotional state. Well, how do you really tease those apart. And there are ways clinically, but sometimes it's really, really hard. So the short answer is no, that probably won't be helpful. But if you withdrew the SSRIs and their mood got even worse, you would know that actually they were treating a comorbid depression potentially. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so the next one uh, is just about uh, a few of the types of therapy and treatment that you mentioned. Uh, so a uh, parent is wondering at what age would you recommend a child or youth try EMDR? So uh, EMDR, um, I have to admit, I'm not as familiar with EMDR as with trauma-focused CBT, but I believe it can be used in even like school-aged children as well. Um, and it Again, the evidence base is not as strong as trauma-focused CBT for this age group. It has a way stronger evidence base for like young adult to adult population. Um, in children and youth, it's, it's uh, not really even close to trauma-focused CBT. So if they're able to tolerate that, I would probably opt for that. But sometimes it's an issue of finding a, a therapist that's skilled in it too. So um, yeah, I think that, that with a school-age child, it would be reasonable, um, but probably uh, it's more commonly used for like the teenage, young adult, adults population. Great. And last one, uh, specific two types of therapy uh, that I can see is a parent wondering about emotion focused family therapy and that if that has any evidence based for, for trauma. Oh, I love emotion focused family therapy. So I forgot to mention, I'm also in the family therapy clinic at Children's Hospital where we eat, live and breathe emotion focused family therapy. And it's awesome. Um, and the thing that it's awesome at is that parent-child relational piece and where we're discussing that the parent-child relationship is a huge source of healing. Um, absolutely, EFFT family therapy can be super, um, super helpful for, for kids who have experienced trauma. Okay, great. So the next question is, um, at what point do you consider trauma to be healed? What does healing look like? So clinically speaking, it would be when the symptoms are sub threshold, which just sounds like a bunch of gobbledygook. But basically, it's when the symptoms are no longer getting in the kid's way or causing a lot of distress, when they're no longer holding the kid back. So um, sometimes with trauma, it's kind of like you have like a thorn stuck in you, and you're going about your daily life, and then you bump up against a wall and you feel that pain, like whenever that Part of your body touches something it's like you feel it really intensely that can kind of be what trauma is like it's like you're fine you're fine and then there's a cue and you're not fine right and so that um when it's when it's popping up for you and getting in your way that's when it's time to do that difficult but really important work of like taking the thorn out to a point where you can move through your life and and not be held back or distressed by what's happened in your past it's never going to feel great or good that that's that that's happened it's more about um yeah just it not getting in your way anymore and still being able to live your full life without being held back or without harboring these negative beliefs about yourself or negative expectations and relationships 
that affect your future. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. And I am noticing there's a few questions with folks who are wanting more information about the resources that were shared or where to find the Super Duper Safety School resource. So we'll connect with you, Dr. Gibson, um, after the webinar and share out the links to all the resources, as well as that specific one to everyone who registered by email. And you should receive that within the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, so the next question from a parent is what does the research say about setting up a younger child, so age three to five? who is adopted internationally with a therapist early in life as additional support in navigating grief, trauma, and loss that's associated with adoption? I think if you, if you have the resources and, and interest, I think that's beautiful. And I don't think it's like you have to uh, wait to see symptoms or anything like that, because a transition in caregiver is a, is a real shift for, for a child. And oftentimes, um, when I've gone to like workshops from clinicians who work with adoptive families and trauma, they really use kind of like a narrative therapy approach where they kind of help work with the family and the child to create like a narrative, like a story of like, this is where I was born. These are who my birth parents were and like developmentally appropriately, just kind of like connecting all of the dots so that they have like a cohesive sense of their, their life journey there's no blank spots or black boxes because anytime there's a void in information, kids tend to fill that void with beliefs or thoughts that are problematic <laughs> or they can, there's a high tendency of that. So it's really better to be transparent and, and truthful and help them make sense. Um, it's so understandable with trauma to just want to like, for all of us and any kind of trauma to just want to like put it in a little box wrap a bunch of string around it, stick it in the back of the closet and never open the door. And if that works, great. But if it doesn't work and you notice you're tripping over it, that means it's time to like open the box in a safe, comfortable, supported way to unpack it so that it doesn't keep getting in your way. And I would kind of think of that scenario as almost like a, a prophylactic or preventative proactive way of kind of helping that youth have a really cohesive sense of their identity and their life journey um, to help reduce the risk that they fill in those blank spots with some unhelpful, unhealthy thoughts. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. Before we go to the last question, would you mind just going to the very last slide in case people do need to head off a minute or two or at least they can jot down our contact information before they have to head off? Thank you so much. So just our, our last question um, is how to help babies and toddlers who have experienced trauma. Yeah. So um, with babies and toddlers, they would fall into that zero to five range where the mo one of the more evidence-based um, therapies would be par child parent psychotherapy, where increasing the security of the attachment relationship is the vehicle for, for trauma therapy for, for the child recovering. Um, there is some evidence for play-based therapy in like kind of three and up range too. I should have mentioned, I don't think I mentioned explicitly earlier, I think there were a lot of questions on children with intellectual and developmental disabilities and whether or not they could participate. And um, you really uh, just need to have sort of like for trauma-focused CBT, at least, you, you need to have um, the cognitive level and communication level of about a, a three-year-old. So um, that would be kind of the threshold at which that model is like evidence-based too. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Gibson, for, for your time, uh, presenting today. That was all just so, so helpful and comprehensive uh, to our listeners. And I learned a lot. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees who for joining today and spending your time with us. Um, and as mentioned before, feel free to contact us at the Kelty Center if you have any other questions or if we didn't um, get to your question that you asked in the Q&A. Uh, we're happy to support you. We have uh, parent peer support workers and staff who are answering uh, the phones um, and responding to emails. Um, you can see up on the slide, we have our email address and our toll-free phone number. You can call us from anywhere in BC. And uh, with that, I think we'll sign off. Um, please remember to fill out the survey that will pop up after the webinar closes. We look at all the feedback and it really does help us inform our future webinars and resources that we develop. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to speak about something I'm passionate about. And I'm really excited that I got to present to parents. I can't see you. I appreciate you coming. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.